We have our guest speaker, Melinda Iyer. Janice, would you introduce Melinda, please? Yes, this is a whole night of don't think you're going to sit down and rest because we've got lots of work to do. I think everyone on this call knows Melinda Iyer and her team from um, Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. And I know that most of us know that she's a co-founder of Save Our Schools in 2017. And I was thinking about that phrase that's almost a cliche at this point about if you think it's not possible, get out of the way of the people who are doing it. And Melinda and her team represent that. So I'm just so pleased that she's here with us. And she's going to uh, tell us about the inner workings, not RTS training. We all know how to do that. And we all do it every Sunday. And thank you, Melinda. I think about you while I'm sitting here for my couple of hours. But we want to know how you choose the bills. Do you look at every single thing? Just what are the inner workings and how do you stay sane? Well, hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me on. First thing I want to address is this. Um, I had a little skin cancer removed from my face today. I'm fine. Uh, my family has been joking that a zombie bill got me. So yes, my name is Melinda Ayer, and I am one of the co-founders of Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. And the bill process that I go through is actually really involved. I look at every single bill that's dropped by the Arizona legislature. And this session, we have had more bills introduced than any other session in the history of our state legislature. So as soon as they start to drop, I look at the sponsor and the short title. And the short title is just that, you know, permanent early voting list, semicolon eligibility, or whatever it may be. And that short title paired with the sponsor's name, for instance, Michelle Eugenti Rita, will tell me that it is up to no good at all. And so that will alert me and then I will read the bill. And I track on average about 20% of the bills that are introduced and keep track of, you know, if Senator Martin Quesada was going to introduce a bill on the permanent early voting list, I would keep track of that as well. But just keep in mind that it will probably never see a committee hearing, but I, I watch it. And I also watch technical corrections, which in the industry are known as strikers. It's a bill that makes just a minor change to statute, and they are used as a vehicle to introduce a completely new language, often completely unrelated to the original bill. And that is how the permanent early voting list bill that was voted down by the Senate last week has come back in Senate appropriations this week. I do talk to folks on the inside. I have friends who are lawmakers, friends who are staff and assistants, and they'll let me know, hey, you know, this is, this is happening or that is happening. And I sit on some stakeholder meetings as part of my work with Save Our Schools Arizona. You know, pretty, pretty decently well connected inside the building. And sometimes these folks will tell me straight up, oh, this is a, you know, an ATRA bill. ATRA is, um, you know, generally up to no good on the tax side of things. Or, you know, this is an ALEC bill or, or this or that. You can see often in RTS, once a bill starts to move, if, if it's been supported by certain lobbyists. But as far as how I help my brain to keep from exploding, most of that is all of you, to be quite frank. You know, if, if I were writing the report and nobody was using it, it would be like screaming into the void. But I know that all of you are out there using this information to help make as Susan said earlier, to help make things easier for your elected lawmakers and, uh, you know, to help those of us in other parts of the state where, you know, we maybe don't have such good representation feel a little more heard. So the, the fact that all of you are watching the legislature like other people watch football makes me very happy indeed. Let's see what people in the meeting have. See if we have some questions. If you'll raise your hand or if you'll send me a chat message, 
I did notice that you said in the chat that everybody is a volunteer, and that is 100% true. It used to be just me writing the report. Um, in 2019, I got an assistant, and this year I have two. Um, we've also, for the first time, got a social media team helping us you know, spread information to get things out to the public. And of course, our team of runners who um, in these COVID times are making appointments going down to the Capitol to register people for the request to speak system. Everyone is a volunteer. So there we, we dropped the donate link in there. Um, if everybody in this meeting sent $5, I think that would probably make the folks at CEBV happy. Uh, Paul Stapleton Smith, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, yes, thank you. It's very generous of you to be here, and the work that you do is uh, amazing across the state. I've served for many years on the legislative committee for the AFL CIO, the Arizona AFL CIO. What are the five or six critical that I can then pin my members? What's the worst of the worst? Or how can you group them? That's a really good point that you make. And when Janice asked me, um, you know, how do I decide something else that I should have mentioned but didn't is, you know, all of my friends in, in the, I guess you'd call it the special interest community, like Sandy Barr at the Sierra Club or, you know, Marilyn Rodriguez at Creso Partners, and these folks that have a singular focus, like the environment or voting rights. Um, and I'm considering their positions as well. And, you know, CEBV take, we are very interested in voting rights. It's one of our top issues, but we do take more of an umbrella focus. So if you're looking for just those five or six bills, you know, maybe you want to narrow it to a single topic and, you know, find find a, um, a group that focuses on just that one topic. So I also write the um, education weekly update for Save Our Schools Arizona. And you know that, that goes more in depth on education. Um, and I, I do believe education is a cornerstone issue um, as far as keeping, you know, keeping our democracy alive and functioning. Um, but that's what I would recommend because, you know, it's with the legislature that we have in the volume of bills, it's, I don't think, possible to just limit to five or six unless you narrow it to a certain issue. Melissa Westbrook has a question. Um, I've actually been meaning to get in touch with you. I, I've lived here a year and I moved from Washington State where I was a public education advocate and I wrote a very widely read public education blog for 10 years. And imagine my surprise when I get to Arizona to tell you, I thought things in Washington State were bad. Arizona's kind of crazy town when it comes to education. So what, what do you think is the likelihood that they're going to keep passing these voucher bills? And what, what, what have you seen as the most effective way to fight that? So I do think that they're going to continue trying to pass voucher bills every year. Um, you know, any of you who use Twitter and follow the governor would have seen today that he convened a large roundtable with religious representatives and the American Federation for Children, which is the DeVos funded, you know, lobbying group. It's, it's a core tenet of of his governorship and you know more to the point the DeVos folks are so well funded they will never stop trying and Arizona has been their playground for many a year and save our schools you know looking at this newest voucher expansion that is frankly even larger than the bill that became prop 305 we have said that we will fight it by any means available to us whether that's another referendum whether it's a citizens initiative or whether it's litigation so you know we're not going to stop either but you know unfortunately that's that's the state of affairs in Arizona Deb von Juklian would like to know if you can explain what the appropriations committee can do what what do they have the power to do well, they're supposed to just appropriate money and consider bills that eventually end up going into the budget. They are given an extra week after the bill deadline to finish, you know, considering these budgetary issues. Um, but a few years ago, they threw the rule out the window that a strike everything amendment had to have something to do with the original underlying bill. And so now it's become sort of a garbage dump clearinghouse for um, 
any pet issue that a lawmaker has that wasn't well considered enough or had enough support to make it through a, a different committee. So I already mentioned the Pebble Bill, um, but if you look at the Senate Appropriations Committee agenda for today, it is just that garbage dump of every random idea, um, which is really unfortunate. And Wally Marcus asks, the conservatives have the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, which drafts and shares model legislation for distribution among state governments. Do the Democrats have an equivalent? So there is a progressive equivalent called the State Innovation Exchange, and they are smaller and, you know, sort of not as well established as ALEC. Um, but I do know the the head of their Arizona chapter and, and communicate with him fairly regularly. And, you know, hopefully with enough time and support, they'll, they'll become um, a powerful counterweight to Alec. And Melinda, do you have any way to track or do you have a sense of how many RTS users there are um, throughout the state? How many in which counties? Um, we pride ourselves in LD9 on being really really big on RTS, but, um, and, and how does it work in the rural counties? Are those people using RTS also? So we at Civic Engagement Beyond Voting, when we started, we weren't really focused on data collection. It was just like, okay, we got to help these folks sign up for RTS. But we have started in the years that have passed, we've started asking for, you know, zip code and legislative district so that we can kind of look. And I, I believe that we have folks using them in the majority of counties. And we have signed over 8,000 people up for RTS in, wow. in, in the five years that we've been in existence. So, wow. Um, I, I can't we... speak necessarily to all of it, but Kathy Sigmund is also on and she manages our mailing list. So maybe she could give a little more detail. Kathy, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, Melinda is exactly right. We, um, our group has grown organically since we started by just running down to the Capitol and signing people up. And that's how I got started. And as Melinda knows, I always call RTS the gateway drug for activism. Um, and it certainly was for me because I started sitting in on committees and then I started watching in the gallery and then I met all these amazing people like Melinda. So we haven't always been as careful about our data collection, but we are certainly more careful now. And we're looking at our activities for the back end of the year. Um, we started to focus on the legislature, but we really do need to operate continuously to keep people engaged. We are going to start mining our, our list, I think, a little bit more uh, carefully to reach out particularly to people in the more rural areas. That's a huge interest of ours because people in the far reaches of the state feel less connected to their state government to begin with, but RTS and um, even Zoom is a great way to become more connected. So that is going to become our year round work. I hope and, that helps. And with redistricting coming, you know, some of LD9 or LD10 may end up, you know, being wrapped into a more rural area as part of that redistricting process. So um, with redistricting coming, it's especially important uh, to do the outreach in rural areas, I think. You we'll just say a little bit about the happy hours. They're two oh, hours okay. long. They're, they're structured such that you can drop in, come and go at will. I start at the top of, uh, of the meeting at four o'clock with a legislative update. We have a featured lawmaker who drops in at 4.30. Last week, it was Randy Fries. And then we do a redistricting update at five o'clock and calls to action at 5.30. And in between that, we have individual breakout rooms available if you'd like some help with or training on RTS. Yeah, I have to say that, I mean, the RTS happy hours have been a huge hit <laughs> with so many people. And I have to say the engagement that I feel from around the state is so heartwarming and so exciting that I have to believe that the next couple of years are going to be really amazing. 
And we share a lot of that at our happy hours. I come out of everyone feeling just so excited and happy about the what I see the future of our state morphing into. Susan, I also Andy. wanted to make a very quick fundraising pitch. I want to thank you, Janice, for putting a link to our, our fundraising. We are an all-volunteer group, but we do, we do have expenses, our mailing list. And we also, although Melinda is very embarrassed, we do help her with her computer expenses, her connectivity, her working environment. It is so important that we treat Melinda kindly because she does so much unbelievable work for, for us and for everyone on this call and thousands of people all over the state. She is a treasure. And if we could pay her a salary, we absolutely would. I think um, the key is just to keep us all from losing money, right, Kathy? Yeah. Like yeah. a mailing list with 8,000 people on it doesn't come cheaply, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You can't and just use Gmail. Right. So we are gearing up our operations for the back end of the year, not just during the legislative session. And this is going to involve a lot more outreach and that that always does involve investing in, in more tools for um, how we reach people. We've done phone banking um, as sort of a pilot project. And one of the things that we uh, we really love about being a statewide group is that we can involve people from solidly blue areas and solidly red areas and engage them in the work of the swing districts because that is how we really move the legislature to where we don't have to fight all these horrible bills. And that is really the ultimate objective for the fall of 2022. Um, so we have a lot of work ahead of us and we are, we are going to be gearing up considerably over the next 18 months. We thank you so much for coming. I know it was a hard day for you, but we're really, really grateful that you are willing to come. Thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for joining us 